my name is Rami Azar, and today I'm going to be talking about um, our custom affordable gene panels um, that have superior uniformity and coverage. Um, so let's just get this underway. All right, so I, I want to begin the presentation with giving you a brief overview. Uh, the first thing that I would like to discuss are our exogen lockdown probes and what kind of performance advantages those give you. Uh, next, I want to move over to the pre-designed gene capture pools, and that's a new uh, custom uh, offering that IDT um, has created to make uh, all, to make gene capture a lot easier and uh, a lot more efficient. So some of the advantages are better customizability, so you have a different customizing option than you did before. Um, decreased optimization time, because we turn around the algos very quick uh, for you. And then also lower costs and um, a flexibility to augment and supplement your panels. And I'll, I'll close it out with a summary at the end. So to begin, uh, when you're looking at sequencing, you have two uh, two major pathways you can go down. You can either sequence everything that you have, which is a whole genome sequencing on the left and the, on the blue side, or you can target enrich, which basically means that you're filtering out all the all the regions that you're not interested in and only focusing in on the regions that you want to sequence. For whole genome sequencing, you take your genomic DNA and you fragment it. So you break it up into little pieces and then you attach your adapters to it. And these adapters are designed to work with a specific sequencing platform, such as an Illumina platform or an iron, uh, an iron torn platform. You then proceed over to sequencing after that. When you're doing target enrichment, you have two sub-pathways within the target enrichment. You have one where you generate amplicons, so you basically use a PCR-based method to uh, amplify regions of interest, and then you proceed uh, to sequencing. However, you can also do tar uh, perform hybrid capture, which basically is using probes to capture the regions that you're interested in. And the hybrid capture works very similar to the way whole genome sequencing works, which is you fragment, you attach adapters. But before you go on to sequence, you take a detour and you do the hybrid capture, which allows you to capture those regions that you're interested in sequencing. Now, there's uh, pros and cons to both. I mean, there's reasons to use the target enrichment, and there's reasons to use whole genome sequencing. Uh, when you're doing whole genome sequencing, you, you don't have the ability to do that many samples in, a, in an experiment because usually it takes all the capacity of a sequencer to do a few, a few genomes, one to a couple of genomes. Uh, whereas target enrichment, you have the option of doing a lot of samples, and that's because your target space is smaller. You're trying to sequence a smaller space, so that same sequencing capacity gives you a lot more samples. Uh, the second uh, point is that the analysis part is different. So whole genome sequencing has a much more uh, complicated analysis because a lot of the genome is uh, quite complex. The human genome is made up of about 50% repeats, and that's a lot of repeats and difficult to align regions that you have to deal with. Whereas with target enrichment, you're dealing mostly with regions that are uh, well understood, well known, and um, easier to align. So you'll have an easier time to identify regions uh, uh, w w during the analysis part. The applications differ because of the because of the type of sequencing that you're doing, because of the amount of information that you're getting. You'll be able to do different things with that information for whole genome sequencing. You primarily use it for discovery. You're looking at uh, potentially uh, looking at mutations that are outside of the exome or outside of coding regions, and you're just looking, searching for something that might be associated with a specific phenotype or disease. Uh, or you're taking a brand new genome. No one's ever, you know, no one's ever sequenced this genome before, and you are doing that sequencing uh, to identify the, the what makes up that genome for that organism. With target enrichment, you're usually looking for a variant. Um, so if you're looking for a, a rare variant or a variant that's uh, found in, in a population that you want to sequence, just those sets of variants. You're not necessarily trying to discover everything within that genome. You're just looking for mutations in specific genes. And target enrichment allows you to do that a lot better than whole genome sequencing because you because you get more sequencing information on that on those specific regions that you want to target, you're able to call those uh, variants with more with more confidence. And that's very important, especially uh, for rare variants where you're you're looking at 10% of frequency or less. So the lockdown probes form the basis of all our um, target enrichment offerings, and these lockdown probes are 
in, essentially in solution hybridization probes. So they're probes that are floating around in, in solution that hybridize to the target space. And these are 120 uh, nucleotide DNA oligos. Um, there's a five prime modification, which is a biotin, and that allows it to bind to streptavin and beads. And I'll, I'll go through the process of that in, in a little bit. All of our lockdown probes are synthesized using our our ultramer synthesis process. Uh, and that ultramer synthesis process ensures that you're getting longer DNA oligos. So you don't end up with a lot of truncated oligos, which have a harder time hybridizing to the target. We provide an easy ordering tool uh, that, that you can go online and just put in the gene symbols that you want and you'd get the, uh, the probes that you are trying to that you're gonna that are be that will be in your pool. You'll also get a bed file, which are the genomic locations of those probes, as well as the genomic locations of your targets. So you can either enter it as a gene symbol, a gene ID. Um, if you have a bed file, you can use that. Those are just genomic coordinates. Uh, or uh, you can also use a FASTA sequence. So if you, if you don't have coordinates because it might be not a, a very well understood organism, but you do have the sequence information, we can design probes using that sequence information. So there's a lot of options to get uh, the probes that you need. Um, so how does this all work? Uh, like I said, the, these are in solution hybridization probes. So what the, what you first start off with is a prepped library. So you've already fragmented your DNA, you've already attached your adapters, and now you're ready to do the capture part. So you, you can start with something like an Illumina TrueSeq HT kit or uh, HT kit prepped library or a uh, Torm library prep, and you want to now block your uh, your, your adapter regions, so these adapters, because it's become single-stranded in order to hybridize, this is all um, just one strand, and you want to block these adapters, which are found on all of your DNA fragments. You want to block them so they don't hybridize together. You get this daisy-chaining effect where these adapters are just uh, binding to each other. You also want to block the repeat regions, which is a COT1 DNA, with COT1 DNA. And COT1 DNA is just a mixture of repeats, uh, and so what you do is you Put, put them into the mix so that they can hybridize to the repeats within uh, the DNA molecules. Again, this would cause a daisy chaining effect where the repeats would bind to each other and cause a lot of unwanted uh, DNA fragments to be captured. The second part is to add the actual lockdown probes. So this is where you're where you're capturing the regions that you're interested in. And so these probes are designed with our tool to hybridize to your target space. And you've got the five prime biotin at the end there. You then introduce the streptavidin beads. These are magnetic beads that are coated with streptavidin. Streptavidin and biotin bind uh, very tightly. So when they bind to each other, you get this large complex where you have the DNA fragment that you're interested in, the lockdown probe at attached to that, hybridized to that, the biotin uh, that's connected to the lockdown probe bound to the streptavidin on the magnetic bead. Because it's a magnetic bead, you can use that magnet to pull that that whole complex out of solution. So you basically pull everything to the wall of the tube or to the bottom of the tube, and you can suck out all the rest of the material, which is all the off-target material that's in solution. You discard that, and you can do a few washes to remove the remainder of the off-target material, and then you can PCR right off uh, the bead. And so that, that allows you to have now segregated your on-target uh, material, amplify it, and then move on to sequencing. So there are uh, various uh, formats of extra lockdown probes. So uh, the lockdown probes are available on three scales. Uh, they're called mini standard and Excel. And basically what these amount to is a reaction per probe. So one reaction per probe. If you order a thousand, a thousand probes, you'd have 1000 reactions. At uh, the standard scale, you'd have eight reactions per probe. So that's uh, again, if you had 1,000 probes, that would be 8,000 reactions. And for the XL scale, you have 64 reactions per probe. So if, again, it's 1,000 probes and 64,000 reactions. And that, that's our custom offering. That's what you would get if you wanted to do something completely custom. We also have panels, which allow you to do um, to capture a large uh, target space that if you have in common with any, if you have genes in common with any of the panels that we offer, you can use those panels to cover that entire target space. And that drives down the cost because these are already pre-made pre, pre uh, stock panels that you can just purchase off the shelf. 
Uh, and for these, we have the acute myeloid leukemia panel, which is 264 genes, uh, the pan cancer panel, which targets the uh, the driver uh, the cancer driver genes for uh, 12 different cancer types. So we've We've worked with uh, Washington University in St. Louis to identify what genes uh, would would drive cancer types, and so they've identified they've identified these 127 genes. Uh, we also have the inherited diseases panel, which looks for germline mutations that are associated with diseases, and uh, th these target about 4,500 genes. And so that's a much wider panel to target um, to target a, a larger section of germline mutations. And the last thing, which is what I'm going to focus the, uh, the rest of the presentation on, are the exon uh, pre-designed gene capture pools, which is our newest edition. So wh why go with IDT probes rather than uh, some other companies' probes? Well, the, f the first thing that differentiates us but, uh, from everyone, from our competitors, is that we individually synthesize every single oligo. This is really important because it's important to get a very high coupling rate. And what I mean by coupling rate is that every base that's added on to your probe has to be added on very efficiently. In other words, not many probes end up with bat, with without that extra base. And this gives you more full length product. And so you can see here on this graph is that this is where our IDT ultramar oligonucleotides are. And at 120 bases, because our efficiency of adding every single base is very high, we have a lot of full-length product. We're at around 55%. For um, standard DNA oligos, which is also still very high, so these are the IDT standard uh, DNA oligos, we're roughly around 40%. But when you look at the industry standard, these are usually done on my, a lot of microarray synthesis, especially for um, uh, t these types of capture uh, probes. You're looking at below 20% for 120 bases. And if you're at 90 bases or 100 bases, you're, you're roughly around 20%. And so there's a huge difference between that. When, when you're do going from one about half or a little bit more than half of your probes being full length to less than one in five, uh, the, the, the ability to hybridize to that target space is diminished when you go down down to the worst, the worst quality. Um, so that allows us to hybridize a lot more efficiently to the target space. Um, we also QC each one, each of these oligos. I mean, even when we synthesize them with a very high uh, coupling efficiency, we still have probes. We still have probes that um, that fail during synthesis, but we're able to catch them because we do mass spec and we do an OD check on each one of them. So when they do fail, we go back and resynthesize it, and then again run it through the QC and make sure that it's it's there and it's a correct sequence, and then pull it in together. Uh, lastly, there, it's uh, sorry. Third, uh, third point is that it's a quick turnaround time. We turn it around in seven to ten business days, uh, so it's roughly you know two weeks. And in that in that time, you can you can optimize a lot better. You're not waiting for your panel, your custom panel, for a very long time. Uh, I think the industry average is about six to eight weeks turnaround time. So this this gets you up and going on your experiment a lot faster. And because we we do. Uh, we, we have a model where we, we do this by probe. We uh, we charge per probe for, for your design. We have found that end-to-end -end tiling is a great solution for our target space. And actually what we've done all our panels uh, with that with that design in mind. And what that allows you to do is be in control of every single tar base that you're targeting. If you're if you don't have a probe that you're unlikely to be you're unlikely to be capturing it. So you control the design. It decreases the cost because you don't have to tile a lot of probes over a single region. You don't have to boost any uh, any regions in that area to by adding more probes. You can just do an end-to-end -end tiling. And uh, for our competitors, th there are boost uh, boost options where you try to add more probes. And there's also uh, inefficiencies in some uh, in some of the processes where you start off with a DNA oligo and then you have to convert that to an RNA oligo and then that RNA oligo is used. Those in, there's inefficiencies in each step, which causes a more truncated product and um, a much more difficult uh, much more difficult hybridization process. So you'll see some dropout regions because the probes cannot adequately bind to the target space. So how do the action how do the action lockdown probes perform as a panel, not just individually? 
Um, and you know, we've we've run a lot of panels. We've run the AML panel a, a lot of times, and basically, what we've seen is that you get over ninety nine percent covered at twenty percent of the mean. So, to explain what that means, imagine your depth of coverage is hundred x. Uh, at 20% of the mean, you're at 20x depth of coverage. For our AML panel, over 99% will be covered at 20x. So again, if your your average coverage for your entire pa- panel is 100x, you're getting 20x for over 99% of your panel. Uh, for for 50x or 50% of your mean, you're you're well over 90%, and at 1% at uh, at the mean, you're about uh, half your half your samples. But that is, that's extremely uniform coverage across your entire target space. You don't see a lot of regions just completely drop out where you're not, you're not able to cover them anymore. And that's an important aspect because a lot of a lot of researchers we've talked to have had to compensate for those regions where they where they were dropping out with a different technology, whether it be a PCR or a Sanger sequencing. And the uh, another advantage of this is that it allows you to multiplex more samples. So you can put more samples in a single capture because you're not worried about having to compensate for low captured regions. So uh, another option for people who are m- adding a lot of samples together that have lo- a lot of dropouts or regions that are not covered well, they end up sequencing with a more throughput. In other words, using more sequencing reads or more sequencing power in order to compensate for those low captured regions. Uh, with 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 this type of technology, you don't have to do that because you're very uniform across the board. And so that means you can put more samples in a single capture, and that means you can be more efficient. So we all, we also, uh, I also want to show you some of the data that it looks like uh, without doing the mean depth of coverage, but actually showing you what the depth of coverage looks like. So again, at 1x depth of coverage, we're looking at ext- almost, almost 100%. Uh, and at 30x depth of coverage, I think we're roughly at 99%. Uh, and these are four samples of, of the AML panel multiplexed on a MySeq run. And the average depth of coverage is roughly about 300x. So uh, we were at uh, over 99% uh, covered at 30x or greater. And again, th- this, this highlights that uniformity that you'll get with lockdown probes. So in addition to the probes working very uniformly and very uh, very well to capture your target space, they all, we've also been able to make the protocol a lot shorter than, than hi- typical hybridization uh, times. So we've been able to reduce the, temp- the hybridization time to four hours rather than the 18 hour, uh, rather than 24 or 42 hour hybridization times. Uh, we can extend to 18 if, you, if you'd like to do that. Um, that is an option, but you can do it as low as four, which allows you to do the entire capture all in a single day. So the total hands-on uh, total hands-on time is over six to eight hours. Um, so you can even go from a complete library in one long day, or, or break it up into two days. But this this turns around your capture uh, much faster. The other advantage of our capture protocol is that you can add more probes to your current capture. So if you are working with a specific panel and you decided that you want to expand that panel, you can do that, and you can do that not just with our pro. Um, you can do that with, with our probes onto a panel or onto a custom panel, and adding more probes doesn't doesn't detrimentally affect the the performance of the the panel that you originally started with. So now I'm going to focus on the XGen pre-designed gene capture pools. And first, uh, I want to describe what they are. Um, so if if you have ordered lockdown probes, you, you, you might have seen them. They all they can come in tubes where all your probes are pulled together. And so for the gene uh, for gene capture pools, if you order them all as one pool, it'll look very similar to that, where your all your all your probes will be pulled into one tube. However, if you order it as a plate, you what you get is uh, individual genes will be placed in individual wells. So all the probes for one gene will be placed in one well. The second well will have all the probes targeting a second gene. So in in this example on on the right in the plate, you have VHL probes all in this well, all the TP53 probes into this well, all the KRAS probes in this well. And what that allows you to do is mix and match and create your own custom panels in your own in your lab. Uh, and that gives you greater flexibility and allows you to share resources so that if you have multiple groups uh, using the same genes, they can share in, in, within the lab. Uh, these 
all of the gene capture pools, whether they're in tubes or in plates, will be shipped wet and ready to use. In other words, are resuspended, and so you don't have to do any resuspension uh, for those. The pre-designed gene capture pools are, are targeting the coding region, so only the CDS of human RefSeq genes. Um, and these are all desi designed in the same way that we recommend our custom design as well as our panels, which is 1x tiling and with repeat masking. And what repeat masking is, is to identify the repeats within the genome that you want to avoid and just don't tile over those regions because those tend to be problematic. The, re the very advantageous, advantageous aspect of this product for, for, for customers who are on a tighter budget is that their flat rate per gene. Uh, and what that means is if per, per gene for 16 reactions, you pay $100 per gene. And that's that's regardless of the size of the gene. So the gene could be a five probe gene or it could be a 300 probe gene. They're all the same price at $100 per gene for 16 reactions. And for the larger scale of 96 reactions, we, we are offering that at $150 per gene. And again, it does not matter what the gene size is. So this makes it easy to calculate how much it'll cost for your experiment without knowing all the particulars. You can you can find out how much it'll cost and you can budget it a lot easier because now the, the price has gone down significantly. And again, this ships just like our, our custom lockdown probes in seven to 10 days. So you get that same quick turnaround time. Oh, one great feature about our protocol, as I mentioned, was that you can supplement existing panels um, with any of our lockdown probe offerings, and that's the same same applies to the pre-designed gene capture pools. You can take uh, the pre-designed gene capture pools and add them to, let's say, your AML panel or your uh, pan cancer panel, or if you have your own custom design panel. Um, so all, all those are options available to you. You can even add them to panels from other vendors. So that, that's, a, that's something else that we've been working on uh, quite a bit. So obviously I've talked about some of the advantages of the formatting, the flexibility, and how, uh, and how well you can, uh, and the costs and the turnaround time. So those are all great features, but how does it perform in the lab when you're actually using it? Um, and we, so we, we, did a, we did an experiment with a, a 20 gene panel that has 385 exons. Uh, it's a 71 KB target space and with 804 total probes. And what we did here was uh, multiplex uh, six samples. On a, on, we put it on a MySeq sequencer and we used 300 uh, base pair paired end reads for this. So what did the data look like? Um, well, we got excellent on target performance. And uh, what, I, what I have here is a breakdown of what the on-target performance looks like. Uh, the bottom blue region is your on-target, and that is not with padded regions or without flanking regions. That's literally your your the exon from start to finish, just, just what you want to target, no added bases on the side. And we break that down to show you how much of reads are going to be within the region that you're interested in. And you can see that it's about 50% across all the samples that we used. If you add in 150 bases flanking either side of your target space, you're looking at over 60% across all the samples um, uh, for for on target with un with unique on target plus 150 bases on either side. We also have some metrics here for what the off target looks like. Most of it is a combination of energetic re uh, repeats or uh, other off target regions, usually energetic regions. Next, we looked at the depth of coverage. So this is what the depth of coverage looks like across uh, your entire target space. So the, the yellow is 200x depth of coverage, and then the dark blue on top is 100x, and the lighter blue on the very top is 50x. And you can see that everything is covered at least 50x, and um, the majority is covered at least 100x. Uh, and that, that again, speaks to the high uniformity of the, the probes as a whole. And, and that same high uniformity is found in the XGen pre-designed gene capture pool offering. So uh, to give an I want to give an example of how you can use these in a lab where you have maybe multiple interests or multiple uh, different types of experiments going on, looking at maybe different types of cancer. So uh, the the pre-design, the pan cancer panel on our website was based off a paper, uh, a Nature paper in 2013, where they looked at uh, 12, uh, Washington University looked at the 
driver mutations for uh, 12 different uh, types of cancers. And so these are the different types of cancers. And you can see some cancers uh, have specific mutations associated with them. So VHL, it's hard to see, but VHL uh, for this type of cancer and a TP53 is one that's across the board, essentially. Um, you know, PK, uh, PIK3CA is pretty much across the board as well. So you can see that some cancer types share um, uh, genes that are very important to drive all of them. And some have very specific uh, specific genes that are highly mutated in those different cancers. So you, you can imagine a core or a lab studying multiple different cancer types uh, that might require a, a several different types of panels. Well, instead of purchasing multiple panels that mostly overlap or, or buying one big super panel and having to bioinformatically remove all the genes that you don't want, you can tailor your, your panels in, within your own lab to the interests of the different groups. And you do that by purchasing these genes in a plate. And so the common genes can be all the ones on the top. For example, let's say you're studying bladder cancer and AML, TP53, KRAS, uh, PK3CA are all common genes. And so you have those all in, let's say, one row. And then the bladder cancer, for the bladder cancer genes, uh, you, you pick EP300 and RB1, you put those, uh, you separate those out. And then for AML, you have uh, FLT3 and MPM1, and those are on the bottom. And so now you've se separated them. And when the person who wants to work on bladder cancer is creating a panel, they use the first column with the common genes and they use a second, uh, sorry, the first row uh, for the for the common genes and you, they use the bladder cancer genes in the second row. And the person studying AML will, will disregard the bladder cancer genes, will take the common ones and then will take the AML ones. And so that way you've now tailored specific panels without any additional cost because you purchased these as these are all the genes that were needed for your lab anyway. So you now you paid for them once, you have them on the lab and you can mix and match them the way you want. So I, I mentioned optimization time. Optimization time is, is incredibly important, especially when you're talking about a six to eight week uh, turnaround time for getting your, your panels. So the, like I said, the average, the uh, industry average is roughly six to eight weeks. So imagine you're starting off, um, you decided you want, you want a set of genes, you order the panel and you, you, you've waited six to eight weeks to get that panel. So now you're already eight weeks in you start testing your panel and that can take anywhere between four to eight weeks. Sequencers take a while to, to run. You want to do a couple of runs and you also want to do the bioinformatics analysis on it. So that takes you a little bit of time to do. And then you realize that you want to optimize that panel. So it's another six to eight weeks to get your second version, your version two of that same panel. And the whole time you're, you're talking about four to six months of just getting one panel to do the basic research of, of finding the, the, the mutations that you're interested in. On the other hand, IDT's optimization time is much, much uh, shorter. You're looking at basically six to 11 weeks total uh, of, of time to, to get the panel. And how and why that is, because you start with only one and a half weeks to, to at, at, the, at the high end to get your panel. So if, you, if it takes a one, one to one and a half weeks to get your first panel, you, you take the same amount of time to test it because you're doing the same types of tests, four to eight weeks. But then it takes you another one and a half weeks to get your second optimized panel. You're talking about now one and a half to three months. You've cut your time in half and maybe even greater than that uh, if it's on the short end, if you're using a smaller panel. So now you, you can actually start focusing on your research rather than working on waiting on a new panel to come. Uh, so it, it gets your experiments running a lot faster. Uh, the other important aspect of the lockdown probes is that it, it sorry, the, the other important aspect of gene capture pools is much cheaper. So uh, l let's just say I, I've convinced you with the presentation on the lockdown, the part of the presentation about lockdown probes, you want to use lockdown probes for as your target capture solution. A custom panel may be too expensive for some labs and maybe too much material. You only want to do, let's say, 16 to 30 samples. Um, let's take the pan cancer panel, for example as, as a, this, a size of a panel that you might be interested in doing. So there's 125 protein coding genes. Those are the ones we're targeting from the pan cancer panel. And you only are looking at the CDS regions, not the UTR. So you're looking at about 5,000 probes. The list price, if you were to get this as a, as a completely custom panel, is around $75,000. It's pretty expensive, but you get a lot of material. 
For gene capture pools, you're looking at a price of $12,500 for 16 reactions. You've greatly reduced that that price. It's it's almost it's over 80% reduction in price for 16 reactions. And for 96 reactions, it's a 75% reduction in price. So you, you can do that same type of tar, uh, that capture with a much smaller budget. And that, that's the real power of these uh, gene capture pools. You can also expand existing... Uh, IDT stock panels, um, you don't have to purchase a new panel. You, you have your AML panel. You just purchase the additional genes that you want uh, to add in, and you can perform a spike in, something we call a spike in, which is adding in those new probes into your current panel. Uh, again, because of the turnaround time is seven to 10 days, you, your new panel would, would be created in a really quickly. So you you start off with a stock panel, which you would get the next day because it's stocked. And then the, the genes that you would add in would turn around in about seven to 10 days. And so you completely have a brand new panel in essentially, um, in essentially two weeks. So I've mentioned supplementing existing panels, and I want to show you some of the data, what that looks like. Um, so we took the pan cancer panel and we added uh, three, three genes to it. Um, and we basically supplemented it in about roughly equal molar quantity. Uh, we did eight multiplex samples captured in sequence on a MySeq sequencer. And what, what, you'll, what you'll see from this is we got excellent coverage as well as uh, very uniform coverage across the board. So this is a shot uh, for, for the bioinformaticians out there or people who work with sequencing. This is a, a sh an IGV. So um, it's basically a snapshot of what uh, a certain gene, and in this case, um, the gene is listed. Um, so the, the re it's a rough seq gene, LDLR, and you can see the exons in the uh, blue rectangles. And so the, these peaks indicate coverage of these exons. These are reads or sequences read uh, over these exons. And you can see this is the pan cancer panel because it does not exist in the pan cancer panel. You do not see uh, very, very much coverage and you don't expect it there to be very much coverage. Some of these reads are just a little bit of background, a little bit of off target material, but the ver you see very, very low one or two here and there. Uh, when you add in the spike in, when you add in the extra genes, the LDR gene that's being targeted is covered very well. You can see a big, large, large peak here, large peaks across all your exon spaces. And this is showing that we're able to cover this extremely, extremely well. So what did the depth of coverage look like? LDLR had 47 probes. It had 271x depth of coverage. The mean depth of coverage is 308. So, and you can see that CKM and PYGM, those are the two other genes that we added, 247 and 263. So very close to the mean depth of coverage. Again, no, no optimization. We just added them in equal molar quantities, and we were able to get that, that very uniform coverage for those target spaces. You can also use gene capture pools to augment panels from other vendors. So you, you've already purchased a panel from, a, from another vendor um, and you're really happy with it. You've already dedicated a lot of resources to optimizing it. You don't want to switch away because it's too costly. You can just, you, but you want to, let's say, increase the target space or you want to uh, cover holes in some of the panels. So you might have regions that you're not targeting very well. You can add pre-designed gene capture pools right onto your panel to either expand it or add them to the genes, even if they're already present in there. So if one gene is underperforming and you want to add more probes to that one gene, you can add that same gene, even though it already exists in your panel, your, your coverage should be boosted in that case. So that, that's all I have for you today. I'm going to summarize uh, basically what I talked about. And uh, mostly what I covered was that action lockdown probes have very high uniformity across your entire target space. Uh, the gene capture pools, are uh, lockdown probes pulled together and that are designed to target the CDS of human genes. Uh, they're a very customizable option and a very affordable option. And th they're able to supplement existing panels as well as panels from other vendors. Uh, they decrease optimization time and they increase your efficiency of sequencing. And with that, I'm done. Um, I'll open it up to questions, but before I do, I would just like, you to, I'd like to say that you, Please follow us. Um, stay informed with, with IDT. We're, we're on a lot of different uh, media, social media channels, uh, Twitter, YouTube, um, uh, uh, Pinterest. Uh, there's just a lot of ways to reach out and uh, either communicate with us or just uh, uh, collect material from, from IDT. So um, 
yeah, I hope you enjoyed the talk and uh, thank you very much for your attention.